All right, uh, we are the Brain Control Group, and um, <laughs> our system works a little too well sometimes, reading things it's not supposed to. All right, so, and so, all right, no, there we go. Okay, eventually it works. Um, so we are the Brain Control Group, and we would like to start off with a little bit of a demonstration. So, I'll start by nodding up to a mom, and I'll fit. With that, we'll begin our presentation. <laughs> so, what you all just saw was a brief demonstration of what we, the Brain Control Project Group for this year's GSIT, have been working on. It's an application we like to call the Facial Typing System, or FTS for short. I'm Rakesh Aurora. This is Rachel Yang, Joe Doyle, and that's Sabra Das Gupta. And what we'll be doing today is we're going to give you a brief overview, a holistic um, summation of the development, the motivations behind our project, and our end product, and what we think about the future of this project. We're going to start off by discussing some statistics, facts, boring information that, regardless, we felt made this a compelling enough project for us to choose for you know, this year's Brain Control project. And um, we're then going to delve into the more technical aspects of our own program. We're going to explain to you some of the issues that we encountered and some of the components that we put into place to fix those issues and what we have as an end product and its utility. Um, we'll finish off by taking a much more broader overview of the philosophy behind our project and what that means for the future. And with that said, I'll give the remote over to Rachel, and she's going to talk to you about some of the background that compelled us to choose this <coughs> one. So, paralytic patients have limited motor control, which makes it difficult for them to carry out daily motor tasks, such as um, communicating with others. So, paralysis can be caused by physical injuries, such as traumatic spinal cord injury, or SCI. So, currently, there are about 200,000 patients affected with SCI in the United States. Um, also, the region where you're injured in the spine affects to what extent you're paralyzed. Um, so, as you can see in that picture, if you're injured in the lumbar region, you're paralyzed from the legs down, but if you're injured in the cervical region, you're paralyzed from the neck down. Um, another cause of paralysis is through neurological diseases or disorders. For example, multiple, multiple sclerosis or cerebral palsy. So there are about 250,000 to 300,000 patients affected by MS, and about half of these patients uh, experience motor, uh, issues with motor function within 15 years of its onset. Mm. Um, for CP patients, it usually affects fetuses or infants, and about 2.11 out of 1,000 newborns are affected with CP. Temporary paralysis can also occur for patients who are recovering from comas or strokes. And this is due to their lack of use of their muscles, which makes it difficult for them to communicate. So in the past, people have used brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, to help mitigate this issue. So the type of BCI we chose was the Emotive Epoch headset. And this headset had an electrooculogram, which measured eye movements, an electromyogram, which measured facial movements, and an electroencephalogram, which measured brain waves. Um, so as you can see in the picture, there are 16 electrodes. Two of these electrodes serve as reference electrodes and measure base signals from the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And the other 14 electrodes read signals based off of these two reference electrodes. The headset also has two gyroscopes, and this is used to measure head movements. And this headset um, can recognize thoughts, and the user can train this in the emotive interface. Um, now, because the uh, emotive epoch is externally located, uh, the felt pads are uh, covered in saline solution to help conductivity. And it's also helpful if the patient has a minimal amount of hair, so it's not in the way, as um, the picture would be an ideal user. All right, so the, the software we used mainly to interface with this headset was the Emotive Software Development Kit, or SDK. 
Uh, there were two main pieces of it, the emotive control panel, which you can see on the left, and the emotive test bench, which is on the right. The control panel let us look at uh, different diagnostics, like see which sensors were active at any given time. Um, it also had interfaces for looking at and reading the processed expression and thought data, and also training each of those to match each per each individual user. Uh, the expression data usually didn't have to be trained too much, but the thought recognition definitely had to. Um, so this was mostly formatted data, but on the right, uh, the emotive test bench gave us access to more raw data. Right here you can see um, all 14 of the uh, electrode feeds, and so you can see there's a lot of waviness and messiness, and it's not a very good uh, way to read it if you don't have it formatted uh, beforehand. So this lets us look at the basic signal of sketting, and the control panel lets us look at the more processed version. So I mentioned the uh, thought recognition. Uh, this is through something called the cognitive suite. The cognitive suite is a part of Emotive that lets you um, train it to recognize uh, a set amount of thoughts. Uh, the interface consists of this cube in a 3D environment, and um, you can train different actions for the cube to do in response to thoughts. So right on the right here, we have the action push selected. Um, the push just moves it farther into the um, background of the image. There's a bunch of different things you can make the cube do, but if you're going to interface with the thought recognition, this is how you're gonna deal with it. Um, even applications that interact with the system get data in the form of push, pull, uh, lift, drop, that kind of thing. So to actually develop the software, we used a number of uh, free tools. Uh, code blocks was what we used to actually develop and compile our application. Uh, SDL was, is a graphics library that we used to actually create the graphical interface for the application. And we used Git to collaborate between us and keep track of the versions of our software. So when you're actually using the system, internally what happens is the um, expressions get converted into a sequence of characters. These characters are then read in by the graphical uh, section of the application to correspond to different commands. Uh, the reason to do this is that it's actually really easy to test it this way. You can actually type these characters into the system without having to have the headset uh, on you, um, and it lets you test the graphical interface pretty easily. Uh, so all of these are default actions that correspond to the characters. These don't have to be uh, strictly these. They can be reconfigured. Um, and uh, in a, if we were to continue with this project, as a next version, we might add this as configurable very easily uh, through a text file or something. Uh, so on the right, you can see all the commands that are used. So dot and dash, the system types through Morse code. So that's, um, th that's what the dot and dash are for. Um, ending letter, ending words, backspacing, and then locking and unlocking, which you saw me do at the beginning of the presentation, um, which basically just lets you continue with normal movement without accidentally typing stuff like I was right at the beginning. And Sabra will talk to you about interface now. So as uh, Joe mentioned earlier, we use SDL to um, create our graphic user interface with UI. And the benefit of having this is that we can have a huge amount of customizability. As you see here, um, we can type all the text um, in one line. We don't have to keep outputting it. Um, and we can also have these boxes, which are suggestion boxes for Morse code and autocomplete, respectively. So it does the green, uh, the green box here. Um, what it does is, as you type dots or dashes, um, it gives you suggestions. Um, based on what you type, so it's very good for people who aren't that familiar with Morse code. Um, and then the blue box over here uh, allows you to scroll down and select the word that you want to type if it pops up um, from the autocomplete. And then as you saw in the demo, um, this box here locks the input stream, and um, it, it, it's just a nice interface to have instead of my console window. So, Initially, I had a prototype application that did not have an autocomplete, and it was very difficult and tedious to type characters, um, type, type words that were um, maybe eight, 10 letters, because you'd have to um, possibly use upwards of 40 facial expressions. Um, but what autocomplete allows us to do is, with just two or three expressions, select common words from a dictionary that we have in the back end. 
Um, so we implement this using a data structure called the ternary search try. Um, and what this is, it's um, kind of like a tree um, where you have a parent node, and each node has three children, um, each node corresponding to a character. Um, the left child, if you look at, for example, n here, the left child um, comes before the alphabet, before n in the alphabet, and the right child comes after. The middle child is part of the word. So if you look at A, for example, um, it does not have a left or a right child, so everything is under it. Therefore, all these words that are in, um, stored in the try start with A. Um, each underlined character here represents the end of a word. Uh, so the way this works probably <coughs> is that we're allowed to, we, we're able to um, run very efficient search functions that run logarithmic time um, for proximity um, and sort of closeness of the word. Um, and then once we compile a list of close words, uh, we can use our dictionary in the back end, um, which has a frequency count for each word, to sort them by which words are um, most so we're mostly used. Um, and the nice thing about this dictionary is that it updates. Every time the program closes, um, the word usage counts are uh, incremented if you use words more. So it kind of learns as uh, you type and use the application more. And here's some test runs we did. Um, you can see all these lines uh, that are white are without autocomplete, and the <coughs> highlighted lines are with autocomplete. Um, you can see that for any common, common phrases, uh, she sells seashells by the seashore, uh, water hurts panda. Um, the times are much less. And this is because, for example, for seashells, I only need to type the first uh, three letters to actually type the whole word out. And you can see a lot less actions are acquired, um, and this results in less mistakes. Um, the problem with this is that if you have non-English words, or if some, or proper nouns, like our names, um, you might take just as much, if not more, time actually typing the word out, depending on how many mistakes you make. Um, so the nice thing about this though is that since the dictionary updates over time, if you use, let's say, I use my word, my, my name a lot um, while I type, I use solder a lot, um, it will actually increment this, and over time it will be um, easier to type that word because it will come up more in public. So going back to the start of my presentation, you might remember that we talked about the philosophy behind our project. Um, we feel that the tools that we use, the programs, the codes, the headset that we use, are all integral to the process. And they're helpful, they're assistive. But what really forms the backbone of a project is the purpose. The purpose of our project is to bring unbridled communication to people with disabilities. It's something that they deserve just as much as anyone. And anything that can be done to expedite that process, to make it more accessible, is something that provides avenues for improvement in the future for our project. Um, we've realized that the headset that we chose causes a lot of discomfort issues um, over the period that it's used. So if someone were to use this project, uh, this headset for say 10 minutes or 15 minutes, something which is very likely, um, they would end up reporting headaches. Um, that can be mitigated by using other headsets because our code is something that, that is easily transmutable and um, that can be transferred to work with other headsets such as NeuroSky and even invasive DCI systems, things that are um, surgically implanted into the heads of patients that prefer that system to these headsets. Um, the code itself, the control scheme that we use, can be modified to suit <coughs> different users. Someone might prefer to nod or raise their eyebrows as opposed to smirking. So all of these things, all of this tweakability, all this maneuverability is something that we feel provides avenues for growth for our project in the future. Um, now, we'd like to take some time to recognize some people without whom this project would never have even come to its inception. Um, our mentor, Erin Carrado, unfortunately, she didn't be here with us. She's been working with this headset for quite a while now. She's a pro at it, and um, her expertise in the matter was something that helped us move through the different variations of this project really quickly. Our RTHF Kowalski, um, his advice was um, invaluable, his editing, his his help overall throughout the project was very, um, was very supportive. Of course, uh, the director and assistant director of our GSET program, Dr. Eileen Rosen and John Patrick Antoine, respectively. And of course, uh, nothing happens without funding, so our sponsors, Morgan Stanley, New Jersey Resources, South Jersey Industries, PSCNG, the GSET Alumni Committee, Rutgers University, 
and the state of New Jersey. We'd like to take some time now to answer any questions that any of you might have, and um, we hope you thoroughly enjoy. Well, 
technically speaking, the, the reason we didn't use a lot of thought inputs was because yeah. our target audience, um, people with stroke, people with paralysis, it'd be hard for anyone in that situation to focus very easily. It's, the frustration levels run pretty high in that demographic, so that's not really a problem that we worried about, but yes, that is a genuine concern. You're literally spilling your thoughts out on screen. Right. Um, I think the cognitive lock was just the beginning of some security measures that you could have for that, but I guess joking about that. Oh, yeah, the, there are a number of different things you could do. Um, uh, you could make it so that it'll only recognize thoughts when you have like a certain position or you initially um, perform a certain action. Um, the accidentally typing things, um, it's, it's an issue even just with the expression triggered um, system. So that's, that is something that um, if we were to actually make this, um, take this and bring it to people who needed it, that would be something we would make, have to add so that we didn't actually interfere with their life more than we're helping them. Fortunately, that's all the time we have left for questions. So um, obviously a very interesting project. I another round of applause. Doing a demo during the break midday. That's true. If you want to see, um, if you want to see the project once again and ask them more questions, back in the VCC where you first were, they will be there during the break, which is coming up in approximately an hour. Thank you very much.